academic title, <laughs> for the record. Um, I'm not sure I'm actually an expert on that, but I, I know a few things. I've been studying anarchism uh, as a personal interest sort of uh, for uh, it's probably about 21 years or so now, so not too long. Uh, I've read quite a, quite a bit of the literature and so forth and argued back and forth. So what I wanted to do today was simply <coughs> define what anarchism is, how it's different from non-anarchism, or statism, as we might want to call it, and then go through a little bit about the main schools in anarchist thought, <coughs> and then get into a little bit on anarcho-capitalism and then open it up for questions, because that's probably where we'll uh, have most of the discussion, I hope. Uh, you probably have some questions on is, it, is anarcho-capitalism really anarchism? And <coughs> how do you solve the problem of roads if there's no government to pave the roads and so forth. Okay, so first of all, if you look in a dictionary, anarchism or anarchy is this weird thing with two different definitions side by side. There's a comma in between. <clears throat> to me, that sounds a whole lot like a political statement in itself because what it says is simply anarchy means chaos, comma, no ruler. Those are not necessarily the same thing. That someone is not ruling me doesn't mean that I go berserk and start killing people and burning stuff and throwing rocks and all this stuff, right? So, in a sense, the dictionary is political <coughs> already in the term anarchism. But what I'm going to talk about is it's not bomb throwing, it's not the beauty of chaos. There's, there are anarchists like that too. <coughs> there are not a whole lot of them. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is the political system, or a political system, of no rulers, or a society uh, that is structured and organized without any rulers. So it's not a hierarchical society going from top to bottom. It's a horizontal society with relationships between individuals and groups of individuals and where everything is bought. So there's no one uh, calling the shots. There's no one pushing rules down your throat, no one <coughs> telling you what to do unless you voluntarily choose to be in that situation. Okay? So, uh, first of all, we need to recognize what anarchists are against, because they were pro-peace, pro-voluntary interactions, pro-anything that is good, basically. What are anarchists against? Well, they're against rulers, and definitely against the state, or government, if you wish. Right? That type of organization that is there only to rule. Now, I ask students in my classes this, too. How do you define a state? And I don't think I've encountered anyone, possibly, except for right there. But other than that, there are there's no one who knows what a government or a state actually is. Which is funny to me because you're supposed to take, or you, I think you have to take, mandatory courses in political science. How can you study the state and government without knowing what the heck it is? How can you live a whole, your whole lives in a <coughs> society that is based on the state without knowing what it is? It does have a formal definition. There is a very specific definition of what, why, why a state is different from any other organization. And the state is not a corporation. The state is not an organization like the Free Enterprise Society. The state is not an, a university. <clears throat> it can do those things, sort of, but what, what makes a state different? What makes it unique that it's not just an organization like any other organization? And it's one word, it's violence. <laughs> The state is defined as monopoly of violence in that territory. Now, some claim to claim it, uh, the definition to be a monopoly of legitimate violence, <coughs> and but that doesn't really mean that it's legitimate in the sense that it's always moral. It's legitimate because it's accepted by subjects. Okay. Of course, if it's not accepted, then there is an uprising, there is a revolution, a rebellion and then there's the state no more. So, but the core of what makes a state 
is violent. And if you think about it, uh, some would argue that taxation, for instance, how, how the state finances its operations, <coughs> is voluntary. If you think so, I challenge you to try it. Try not paying taxes and see what happens. The first thing that's going to happen is that they will probably remind you that you forgot something. <coughs> Add some fees and so forth. The next thing that's going to happen is that they come looking for you. And then you close the door and say, I don't want anything to do with the organization. I'm not a member. Bye. Then they're probably going to break down your door and probably going to freeze your accounts. They're going to take your money. And if you resist <coughs> and say that you can't do this, they will probably try to arrest you. If you resist arrest, they will probably harm you. If you continue resisting, in the end, they might shoot you. And they claim the right. <coughs> of course, I'm pushing this <coughs> a little bit, but the state at the core is this proclaimed right to violence. If anybody has the right to kill anyone, whether it's a war on foreigners in a foreign land somewhere, a defensive war when someone attacks us, or if it's a war on its own people, <coughs> it's still violence that is the core. This is what anarchists are against. <coughs> okay, so that organization based off of that, whatever other things the state does, since that is the core, it must go. It could be a king, it could be a democratic government, it could be whatever, but that type of rule is not okay. That is anarchism, that's the, the definition. Now this doesn't mean that everybody has exactly the same view of what will be instead, right? We all have our preferences and, and our <coughs> view of what should be the case and what things, what will be the case if we abolish the state and the government. Now some would claim that, oops, that's when everybody starts uh, warring on everybody else. That's the Hobbesian view, right? If no one is always pulling the strings and having us in leashes, <coughs> then we will kill each other. <coughs> if the government doesn't tell us that if you kill someone, you go to jail, we would all kill each other. If the government doesn't say that you can't do drugs or you go to jail, we would all be shooting heroin. Right? Obviously, there is something more to this. Right? There's something to uh, voluntary interactions, to society that is not necessarily based off of the state. That's the discussion within anarchism, though. What is that society like, and what should it be like? What is the ideal society? <clears throat> and this is where we have different schools of thoughts and different traditions in anarchism. And some of these really don't like each other. But if you think about it, just to rule the state, you have all these different ideologies, right? You have all these different types of parties and all these different types of movements, and they're all wanting to shape society in their own way, according to their own views, their own values, right? <coughs> the same exists for society without the state. It's just that they're not looking to take over a power machine, that, that uh, right to use violence, but they still want to see a society that fits with their own ideals. So you have exactly the same number of ideologies on the anarchism side as you do on the state side. It's not that strange. People have different values, right? It's not a value that you base society on to be just against violence, unless you're just a pacifist, right? But you can be against the state and be a socialist. You can be against the state and be a capitalist. You can be against the state and be all these different things. So the same ideologies basically apply for <coughs> how you view society without the state. So if you go back in time, the first person to call himself an anarchist was Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, the French member of parliament, which might seem a little odd, but he was a member of parliament. He was the first to say that he was an anarchist. And up to that point, it, that word had really meant sort of what it still means in, in the dictionary, both chaos and without rule. <coughs> and this was the mid 19th century. Um, and then you had kings, 
you had always had a government that ruled everything and you had nobility with special privileges and all this stuff. Right? So <clears throat> in a sense, people would believe automatically that being without a ruler is the same thing as having chaos because that's what the rule, rulers always say. Right? Without, without us, there would be chaos. I am the reason you're still alive and you're, that you're leading a good life and all this stuff. <coughs> now, Proudhon, uh, he was a, a socialist, but a socialist in the sense of non-Soviet Union, sort of, right? And not a statist socialist, <coughs> which makes it a little different. So if you're a statist socialist, you want to use the state towards socialist ends, basically take over private property, if you use the traditional um, definition, and make all property uh, state property even though you call it public or uh, common property. Now, to Proudhon, he had different ideals for what the society should be like and how to reform it and so forth. Now, the funny thing is that even though he was a socialist, he had a big enemy and they had correspondence that was pretty nasty, if you read the correspondence, with a fellow who you might think of as socialist guy with a big beard called Karl Marx. They really hated each other's guts. And if you know anything about Karl Marx, he hated anybody who was not a Marxist, so it makes sense. But Proudhon actually hated Karl Marx as well. <coughs> exactly why? Well, <coughs> there's plenty to read on this. And Proudhon was also in the parliament at the same time as the French liberal uh, Frederic Bastiat. So they were sitting on the same side of the middle aisle, on the left side. This is what we're going to talk about the left and the right today. The right was the, uh, the conservatives uh, who didn't want to change anything. They were pro the king, pro the nobility, pro those, this is hierarchical society the way it was. Don't change anything, especially not rap rapidly. Right? And on the left, you had those radicals who wanted fast change, and they wanted to get rid of the king and all this stuff. And those were the liberals, in the classical, traditional sense, like Frederick Bastiat, and the socialists, like <coughs> Proudhon and Marx, and people like that. <coughs> okay, today we refer to Proudhon as a mutualist, because he's sort of in the middle of the spectrum. What he, what he was proponent of was really that, the, that society should become one with the economic organism. So if you read his books, he would talk about how abolishing government is number one. The problem is number one for all anarchists. And then he had all these crazy ideas with the free banking system with free money so that you have enough money to invest in your business and in your farm and so forth and dividing property between people. But property was possession-based so that... <coughs> As soon as you leave your property, basically, someone else can just squat it and take it over. So you're not supposed to be able to own anything other than your personal belongings. Okay? So what, what Marx and Marxists refer to as personal property. You can still own your clothes and your car and, and things like that, but you can't own land, you can't own a house, you definitely cannot own the means of production. Okay? You have a separate... Uh, school of thought that really started in Russia, this was before Putin, uh, where you have a, a tradition that is sort of more extreme to the socialist, in the socialist sense, uh, theorizing on anarchism as communism. And they call themselves anarcho-communists still. Um, they're based off of the, the writings by primarily Mikhail Bakunin, who wanted to abolish the government to replace it, basically, with a global uh, federation of labor unions. So what he wanted to do was organize workers and the proletariat in local labor unions who would then cooperate in regional federations, who would then cooperate in national federations, and then in the global federation of labor unions. So you would go, get rid of 
any capitalist, <coughs> any owners of, of uh, uh, factories, you would get rid of the state and politicians and the nobility and everybody would be a worker and everybody would be <coughs> obligated to be <coughs> excuse me, a member of this the global labor union. <coughs> it sounds a little strange to me since you're basically getting rid of the state to replace it with a mandatory labor union that you have to be a member of that makes all these decisions necessary. <coughs> but that's his, his view of what would be the, the case without the state. You also had uh, Peter Kropotkin, or Pyotr, as he would be called in, in Russia, who was a prince who had similar ideas. Uh, and this will give you an idea of how influential these thinkers were. When Kropotkin died, he was, he was uh, buried uh, in Moscow. And people showed up to his funeral, and there were thousands of people showing up. So there are pictures from these sort of drawings and things like that of thousands of people standing in line waiting just to be able to say goodbye to this thinker of anarchy. So it's not, it's not this marginal sort of little political movement that never had any influ influence and that we can just disregard completely. It has had huge uh, political influence uh, over the course of history. <coughs> Of course, the, the ideas go back to way before uh, ancient Greece, that the idea that there shouldn't be a ruler. I mean, obviously, people have had those ideas for a very long time and theorized on it. OK, so you have anarcho-communism anarcho from Russia. You have the mutualists uh, in, in Europe around Pradhun. <coughs> Here in America, uh, there were a, there was a very vital anarchist movement as well, uh, inspired by Pradun's thought. And being just like Pradun, talking about the, war, the uh, society as becoming one with the economy. And they focused on the division of labor and specialization and free market trade, basically, but without private property, especially of the means of production. <coughs> that was Pradhu. In, in this country, you had people like Benjamin Tucker, uh, Lysander Spooner, uh, and many others, especially the end of the 19th century. They had a bunch of magazines and, and journals that they published. They published books. Uh, they were very act active in, uh, in the movement to abolish slavery and things like that, right? Because no masters, no slaves. It's a, uh, an anarchist slogan, right? Uh, this American tradition combined the Proudhonian thought with typical American tradition of individualism. Right? So it was more individualists than, than Proudhon. It was more of a collectivist, even though it was voluntary. So <coughs> they're, they're called individualist anarchists today. Um, they were totally free market socialists. What that means is that they were pro-equality -equal between people, anti-power, anti-property, especially of land, but pro-property of value that you create. So for instance, Tucker would argue that, that you cannot own land itself, <coughs> but if no one else has a claim to that land and uses it for anything, and you improve the value of the land, and you clear it, and you build a farmhouse on it, and things like that. What you created, that's yours. Because you used your labor and, and your effort and your ingenuity to produce this value. So that value is yours. The land itself is not. So <coughs> to Tucker, you could still have a market for houses, a market for farming and things like that, even though you can't really own the land itself. Okay. Then you have more schools. <coughs> you have in Europe. You have the the one guy movement of Stirner, who wrote the ego and its own, or really the ego and its property. This is egoist anarchism, <coughs> where it's basically I'm an anarchist. I do what I like. Don't come and even 
talk to me and tell me what you think is right and what you value, screw you, because I do it my own way. That's, that's sort of, sort of anarchist, to summarize it very quickly. Right? But he was a philosopher and a writer and so forth. So you can see that there are very different, many different tastes of anarchism, just like there are in different statist ideologies. Of course, in statist ideologies, people focus on what should the state do, how much should the state do, how should the state be run. Those are the questions that people discuss, right, in, in political parties and movements and so forth. <coughs> Anarchists, for obvious reasons, do not discuss how the state should be run or what the state should do, because that's already settled. It shouldn't do anything. It should be gone. And right now, it's possible. Right? Uh, and then you have the, the modern version uh, of individualist anarchism, sort of drawing from individualist anarchism and classical liberalism at the same time. So basically, you take Pradun and his fellow member of parliament, Frederick Bastiat, <coughs> you put them in the bag and you shake it up and you add a little tucker, and you shake a little more, and then you are, what you get is basically a Murray Rothbard, uh, <coughs> who's in, often referred to as Mr. Libertarian. But he's also uh, the guy who coined the term anarcho-capitalism. And why? Because he's totally free market, he's totally private property, and totally anti-state and anti-government. <coughs> So what he did was simply draw from these three that I put in the bag and, and, and then shook, right? The uh, Produn, <coughs> his views of market and trade and anti-government, the individualism from Tucker and so forth, and the property bit and the understanding for the economy that the classical liberals had. Because if you go back to the 19th century, Socialism was born out of liberalism, <clears throat> not liberalism the way we use that term today in the U.S., but liberalism the way it was used before. <clears throat> liberalism was about small government, it was about uh, private property and let the economy sort of sort itself out. There was a harmony thinking about the economy, let property, let people uh, manage their own property and trade with their own property, and this will take care of themselves. We just need a little government to protect the country from foreign intruders and to protect people from crime, which is basically murder, <coughs> theft, and fraud. Now, of course, if you take that and Produn and Tucker and put together and you throw out government, what do you get? Well, you get a complete free market right, where you can own property, where all things are really handled in, in the economic organism, as Pardon would call it, or it would be handled voluntarily without economic means. So this, this is a vision of society where you can protect your property by simply using a security firm. You can insure your property by using an insurance company and so forth. <coughs> All those functions really exist today. It's just that they're limited because government has decided what they can offer, and government has also uh, monopolized some of these functions. Right? <coughs> some things companies cannot do, and why can't they do it? Is it because there is no market? No, it's because the state tells them that they cannot do it. Is that easy? Okay. So in Murray Rothbard's vision, he has plenty of competing corporations offering protection for property. Uh, <coughs> conflict resolution would then be between uh, those companies rather than between the people. So people wouldn't fight each other, they would just basically call their insurance company saying, hey, I have a trespasser right here, come and grab him or something. Or this guy stole from me, I have proof, so please steal it back for me. That sort of thing, right? So then my insurance company is going to talk to his insurance company and they're going to figure out a solution. Pretty much like, like what happens today between the insurance companies when you're in a car crash or something like that. Whose fault was it? Well, we have all, the, we have all these rules for, for how you are allowed to behave in traffic and so forth, right? And you have witnesses telling the same story. <coughs> okay, then the insurance companies will simply say, yeah, okay, well, it's obviously it was his fault, so we'll pay up. 
according to those terms that we have already agreed on between these companies. Right? Now, <laughs> does this cause any problems? Well, of course, it potentially can, right? There are some issues that might be in your minds would be such things as national defense. How do you deal with free riding, that sort of thing, right? If everybody's their own or they stick together with, with their families on, on their piece of land and they insure it with a protection agency, as Rothbard calls them, <clears throat> what is there to what is to stop, say, Russia from invading the US and just saying, like, hey, it's our ours, you don't have an army, so we'll just bully you and <coughs> people are just gonna give up. Right? Well, I think the problem here is to call it national defense, because what the heck would be national under anarchism? National is usually the state's territory, right? Other than that, there's also no one saying you can't have guns at home. So it would be more like the Swiss defense, <coughs> which is not a formal army, but rather a mandate that everybody should have a gun at home. So how do you take over Switzerland? Well, either you you bomb the crap out of the country. So there's nothing left. That's one way of doing it. You don't actually get much then, because right? you want the people and the infrastructure and everything. Or you basically knock on doors, go house to house, and take them over. That's a very <coughs> hard thing to do. Right? Imagine doing that in the US, <coughs> knocking on everybody's doors and tr saying, hey, do you surrender? Sign this, <coughs> sign this deal. and." Give me all the guns. Some might lie and not give them the guns. And, you know, some might take off to the, uh, the nearest forest <coughs> and start a little band of people to have a, a, a local rebellion and things like that. Those are really costly if you're taking over uh, a new territory. And what you're trying to do is really to subdue them to your power as a state. Right? There's no other reason why you would take over a territory. And if you think about it, even the defense is centralized in the way of state. Now, how do you take over a country, say Sweden, where I'm from? How would you take over Sweden? Well, you would just look on a map and see there's a base there, there's a base there, there's a base there. And then your computer, tap, 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 three bombs, and then there's no defense anymore. Right? Where is the defense? Because the bases are gone. You've taken out the, that defensive infrastructure. So who is going to defend the country? The people who do not have the right to bear arms? Obviously not. What are they going to do? Through, through rocks? Of course they can do that, but that's not a, a big problem, right? <clears throat> Think instead of, as an anarchist of this. How would you defend a society or a town or something like that? Well, you don't have an army. You don't have a base that you can just bomb that little pit, bit, bit right there and then that's gone. You have to take over and subdue each and every individual, or at least every family. That's the only way of taking over. And then you need to make sure that you keep them subdued. You keep them uh, under your boots, so to speak. Because that's the only way of controlling them. Like you have to. There's no other way of doing it. Okay, so national defense is often brought up as a, a, an argument against uh, no state or stateless society. But I think national defense, <coughs> first of all, national is probably uh, the word that should be em emphasized, which makes it uh, irrelevant from an anarchist point of view. And then, if you think about it, defense, if that is centralized, you just take out those islands of centralized defense and defense is gone. It's a whole lot easier to take over a country <coughs> that has a state than a country that doesn't have one. Not only because you have a centralized defense like this that you can just take out pretty easily, because <coughs> there are maps, right? And everybody knows where the where the bases are, because there's road signs. Everybody knows that. <coughs> but also because the population is used to living under a state. So what you do 
it's exactly what the old kings did, right? You have those layers of society in hierarchy already, and they all abide the king. <coughs> How do you take over? Shoot the king, and then say, I'm the king now. Easy. The whole structure is there, right? The whole structure is based on that one guy who is the king. So all you need to do is get rid of that guy and proclaim to be the king yourself. Easy. Everybody just continues as usual, which is usually what happened, right? Because very often the king was far away and <coughs> didn't really uh, have anything to do with your everyday lives. So, yeah, okay, so there's a new king. Okay, that happened last week too. So, so what? But the rules are enforced just like before. Taxation is just like before. Uh, your local church, as was often the case, the priests, as well as the noblemen, <coughs> would continue to oppress you just like before. The privileges <laughs> would be there just like before. No big change. But try to take over and subdue a population that doesn't have it. It's very different. Because then you have to start by teaching them that, no, you have to abide by these decrees because otherwise I will try to find you and find someone to tell me exactly what happened and I'll have a court system and stuff. <clears throat> and then I'll put you in jail because you didn't do what I said. People aren't used to that. Why would they agree to, it, to do that at all? They wouldn't. We're used to following rules. <coughs> Think about it this way. I don't know how many of you have, have had time to read the quote, by the way. So take a minute to, to read that quote. <coughs> it gives you an indi indication of historically uh, what this is like. But how many of you have ever driven a car and a police car pulls up behind you at a corner or something like that? Raise your hands. <coughs> how many of you felt that, whew, safe now? You're laughing, but isn't that the point? To protect and serve? How many of you got nervous think, think, thinking, holy crap, what have I done? <laughs> exactly. Right? What does that mean, what have I done? That means you don't even know the decrees you have to follow. <clears throat> Which means the state apparatus has a bunch of rules you can't even keep track of them because there are so many. And then there's the enforcer of those decrees close to you and you go, holy shit. Now what? And you drive like this. Well, that is a problem, isn't it? Right? If we are the government, this, this shouldn't be the case. Right? So it, it indicates to you that something might not be exactly what you thought it was like. Right? So, <clears throat> From an anarchist perspective, it's obvious why you get scared or a little shaky when this happens, right? Because they are just <coughs> they're just the long arm of the state. Notice how I didn't say the law. I said the state. Because there's a difference between law and state. And anarchists aren't necessarily opposed to law. Some of them are. But law could be <coughs> local. They could be based off of people's uh, norms and values. Pretty much the common law system. There are many anarcho-capitalists who are pro the common law system. I don't mean the common law system the way it is used today, but the common law system the way it was. If you think back historically, it was simply that if there was a conflict, and remember, everything is private property and there's no decrees or anything, but if there's conflict, it's usually theft or you hit someone or, or defrauded someone or something like that. So there's always a victim. That victim goes to the perpetrator and says, screw you, I want my money back or whatever it was. If they can't solve the problem, what do you do? You go to a third party. Someone you both trust, someone you both say, okay, well, we'll, we'll let this guy sort it out. You both, he will listen to both of your sides of the story and then make a decision. That's the old common law system, right, where <coughs> law was not codified. It was definitely not 
pushed onto people from above, it sort of bubbled up through solving conflicts. And you had private judges uh, walking around offering their services because they were trusted, wise, elderly men usually. And if there was a conflict, you just looked them up and you said, this is a conflict. And said, okay, well, according to our traditions and according to all these uh, verdicts from before, from people like me and in my own experience, this, this should be the case. You are in the right, you are in the wrong. And this should be the punishment. If it is a new case, they would think about, okay, what, what are the values of society? What <coughs> verdicts have, or decisions have judges made before? Uh, and how will my new decision impact how people lead their lives from now on? Well, that's a different type of law than the laws we're thinking of today and that we have to abide today. Right? This type of law would simply be this is how we do stuff. This is what we believe is right and wrong in general around here. Right? And we have a history of judging these cases you know, of conflict. So that law is changing with people's morality and people's ethics. <clears throat> that law is well known because it's our values and ethics. It's pretty easy. Right? And every law, and <coughs> I'm sorry, every Every time, every crime has a victim, which is not the case today. Most crimes do not have victims, right? The law today is very different because then you have someone is writing down what should be the case, and then you have that guy in the car behind you when you started shaking. It's supposed to make sure that we follow those laws, and there are rules for how much money they can take from you because you, you uh, violated those rules, or <coughs> they can put you in jail for a bit and, and stuff like that, right? But in a common law system, in, a, in a, an anarchist system, what would a jail be? Who would pay for that jail? Because if you think about it, taxpayers pay for the jails, right? Taxpayers are also the victims of crime. So, you're the victim of crime, that guy is tried in court, which you pay for, then put in jail, which you pay for. There's no restitution. An anarcho-capitalist would argue that the only outcome of a conflict is restitution, which means you make it right again. So, of course, that makes it hard if you murdered someone, but there are ways of getting around that, too. <coughs> and your, the point of the verdict is simply to make the victim whole again. You caused the problem, you caused the harm, so you should make, <coughs> make, it, make, it, make that up to this person. Okay? Today, laws are very different. If you think about it, we talk about the law. Then everybody think once or twice at least. Why do we refer to all those laws as the law? Singular? Those are a lot of decrees. Some of them are even contradictory, which is very hard to follow. We refer to it as the law because this country rests on common law traditions. The law was all those decisions made by judges and sheriffs in the Wild West and so forth, right? But the law was the people's law. The law was the people's morals and ethics and values. So, yeah, it changed with when people's views and values changed, <coughs> but it was a body of law in the sense that those are the values, so if there's a conflict, we'll solve it using our values. It's easy. Today, you can basically enact any law saying anything, and you have to abide by it, whether you like it or not, whether anybody likes it or not. It can be completely immoral. So an anarchist would argue that, see, laws are simply tools for oppression. They're just making us do all these things that we don't want to do, and we don't even have a say in formulating those things. That's a 
huge pr problem. And people think that it's a, it's a good thing. And sometimes they even mix up what is law and what is morals. Those aren't the same things. Those are different. I mean, you can be a very moral person in Nazi Germany and break the law every day. By hiding Jews, for instance, right? Or here, 150 years ago, helping slaves escape. Completely illegal, completely moral, in my view. <clears throat> right? So it's a difference. It doesn't have to be a, a dictatorship to see that there is a difference. Those are not necessarily the same thing. The question is, should they be the same thing, or should they be different? Should there be a state? Does it solve any problems, or should there not? <clears throat> and what would such a society look like? Well, depending on who you ask in those anarchist traditions, that society would look very different. I mean, I'll, I'll end with one story that I heard a guy argue, and I argued he didn't know what he was talking about, and you'll soon see why, I think. And he said that under anarchism, this would be the case, that down the street from where I live, he said, there's a vending machine. Well, because of this privileged system that we live under today, I have to put money into it to get stuff. Under anarchism, I would just go there and get stuff. Of course, it sort of begs the question of who is going to stock that thing and why? Why don't they run out of food and stuff in that vending machine? We didn't have any answers to that. But there are answers to that from all of these anarchist traditions. Okay, so I'm ready for your questions. If you have it. <coughs> yes, sir. Why does anarchism not turn into a monocracy or Why does it not? <coughs> depends on who you ask. Right? And it depends on your view of, of people, too. I mean, if you start with a the Hobbesian view, when it, without a state or a ruler, it would be everybody's war on everybody. Then you don't actually solve that problem by having a state, because that just gives some people the power to have to wage war on everybody else, and it's legitimate, right? So either people are by by nature uh, evil and want to oppress people, everybody else, and then a state can't save us either. Or we're not, I'm not saying necessarily that everybody is a good pacifist or whatever, <clears throat> but if we're not, then we don't, might not need a centralized power to force us to behave in certain ways. <clears throat> we do a whole lot of things, um, not because there is a law, but because we want to, because it's expected from us, because it's, those, are, those are ideas that we were brought up to believe in, things like that, right? For instance, how many people have you murdered? I don't want to give myself away. Yeah, <laughs> you take the fifth? <laughs> okay, well, let's say it's zero. <laughs> For the sake of argument, okay? <clears throat> the question we have to ask ourselves, is it zero because the state says you cannot, or is it zero for some other reason? I would guess that it's for some other reason. Because if it is because the state says you cannot, there is no one in here working for the government. There is no police officer in here. So I'll just shoot you. Right? Because it's not enforced right here, right now. And if I shoot all of you, then there are no witnesses. I might not get caught. Except for Facebook Live. Well, except for Facebook Live. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> Let's say I do this. <laughs> okay, except for that. That's a good point. But the thing is that we do a whole lot of, <coughs> of things and we refrain from doing other things because we don't think those are good things. Right? We, we behave uh, in group settings and interact with others in a good way because that benefits ourselves. I mean, there's no contradiction here. Right? So... You place strangers in a room, strangers from different, different cultures, they're not going to be at each other's throats. They're going to take it a little slow and they're going to say, hi, 
who are you? And they're going to start talking and they're going to understand more about each other. And it doesn't happen that they start by, oh, look at you. You're different than I. That's not how we act as people. We're social beings, right? And we, we have social rules, some rules that we, we don't think about, but are simply there <coughs> because it's, it's easier. And I mean, I think most of you are Americans, right? One thing that is mind-boggling for a foreigner like myself is walking on a campus like this. Because everybody walks on the right side. Why do you guys walk on the right side? Is it because there's a campus police looking? No, it's just natural to you. And as a foreigner, I see this because that's not the rule where I'm from. <coughs> right? So I've done the experiments a bunch of times to walk on the left side when I meet someone. Whoa, there's plenty of confusion. <laughs> they go like... <laughs> and they stop. Right? But because it's easier to walk on the right side, that's not oppressive. It's not oppressive to follow that rule, and no one ever told you the rule either. That, hey, if you walk on the walkway over here, then <coughs> walk on the right side. If you meet someone, always yield to the right. No. There's no rule, there's no enforcement. It's just that it's a whole lot easier, and we, we figure those things out in communities and families and <coughs> towns and, and regions and so forth. Because it's just easier. We don't want the conflict. Right? So, <coughs> I mean, if, if, in a sense, if the structure is there for someone to get power, just like in replacing the king, then I can see people going for that. Otherwise, the tools that you have, the means you have for change, the persuasion, and they're acting differently yourself, but not forcing someone. Because <coughs> if I would suddenly jump Toby right here and start hitting him, what would you guys do? You'd just look and say, oh, Swedish behavior. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would not. You would, okay, you would change the video cam to get the fight. Uh, you get more viewers too, probably. No, you would not. You would probably interfere, right? You would stop the fight. Why is that? No one told you to. There's no law saying that you need to stop the fight. No, because, because we don't like fights. Right? We, we don't want this stuff. Why can't we just all get along? A lot of people say this. Right? And most of us believe it too. So I don't think that is a problem. So why do we not see any um, widespread communities of anarchism in the world today? Well, there, I think there are two answers to that. One is uh, one is there, there are not because they've been crowded out by <coughs> an evolutionary process, basically, starting with tribes <coughs> uh, who needed a, a strong man or chief just for survival at that point. That has just evolved into then uh, uh, kingdoms and then feudal society and then democracies. So, I mean, what is happening is that more and more people are getting involved. Power is more and more dispersed, even though the state itself is sort of being centralized because it's, it's reacting to this. <coughs> so, a, I think we're, we're heading in that direction in a sense. The other answer, which is I think both better and, and more positive is that there's anarchy all around you, everywhere, in this room. My previous example, why don't we kill each other? Why am I not hitting Toby? Those are, what we're doing here is perfectly voluntary social interaction. And whether it's a law or not doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm sure no one ever, ever met anyone who smoked pot before it was legal anyway, right? How many called the pot cops at a party or something like that, he's smoking pot? No, you didn't, because it didn't bother you all that much, right? Well, that's anarchy, that's even anti-state anarchy in a sense, right? Because you're breaking the law, and I think you know that you're breaking the law too. And people just go, yeah, there's no problem because no one is harmed. There's 
no victim. <coughs> it's perfectly peaceful, and I, I might be of that too. <coughs> Who knows? All of these things, and we're friends, and so <coughs> any voluntary action that is not uh, demanded or mandated by the state is, in a sense, anarchy. One last yes. question. Hey. Okay, so to kind of segue off of Dr. Trost's question, yes. you mentioned earlier about how it was ironic that essentially the first self-proclaimed anarchist was actually like an entrenched bureaucrat. So mm -hmm. do you think that like, I guess bureaucracies or like the state kind of has developed this natural internal protection for itself against, as a result of anarchy, to where, like, if I was an anarchist and then I run for public office and I say, like, I'm going to fight, I'm an an anarchist and everyone in my district elects me because <coughs> I'm going to fight the entrenched bureaucracy, but there are so many protections set up. And I guess when Dr. Koppel was here talking about the deep state, he said, like, basically the reasons that the state gets so deep is because all of these coordinated interests are to continue to perpetuate the state. Mm -hmm. So I guess would you say that there's, like, <coughs> like I guess that's an unintended consequence of the state is that in reaction to anarchism, it's set up this almost internal protection for itself. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't be conspiratorial and think that, hey, whoever is a government employee is there and saying that we need to protect the state from voluntary interaction. <laughs> that's not what's going on. I mean, but if you were working in government <coughs> and you have a certain role, you're protecting your interests, right? And you're, you're making sure that that no one will undermine your position. And in this country with two parties, I mean, they're just, you, you change a few people, but it's basically the same people, back and forth. And they hire the same people, and of course there are gonna be laws that sort of protect the people in power. I mean, ask anyone, if you get the, the power to set your own salary and decide your own work hours, and decide who pays. Well, then your salary is going to be a whole lot higher than if you start a business or do something productive with your time. Right? But that's basically what is what is going on. So the, it's not a conspiracy, <coughs> but there are definitely protection mechanisms that sort of spontaneously emerge. So almost this. like an unintended cycle, like a cyclical perpetuation. Yeah, of the state. Uh, in in defense of the state and what it is and what it does. Yes. Okay. Do you differentiate? Do you differentiate between <coughs> anarcho-capitalism and objectivism? Yeah, because objectivists are statists. So yes, I mean, for those who don't know, objectivism—that's uh, <coughs> the philosophy or politics of Ayn Rand, uh, and Atlas Shrugged, and the Fountainhead. Uh, but she was very, very much a proponent of a state, just a small one. <coughs> And I think she was in favor of not taxation, because that's theft, but for the government to stamp contracts to enforce them, to say that this is a legit contract, so you stamp it and you pay a fee for that stamp. I think that was her idea. Um, Anarcho-capitalists uh, don't want that state. doesn't matter how small it is. They might be different in, in terms of what is moral and what is not, too, so different systems. But I mean, I would say plenty of anarcho-capitalists started out reading Ayn Rand. So uh, there's even a book called It Usually Starts with Ayn Rand. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. 